This is House Planning Help, episode 83. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you want to self-build or retrofit. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century. My personal goal is to create an energy efficient home before I turn 40 in August 2016. In this session, author Michael Mobbs is my guest and he shares what he's learnt from trying to live sustainably in the city. This is in Sydney, where I've spent some time recently, and I also venture into his sustainable house. Today, though, I want to start actually just rewinding and going back a few steps because my podcast introduction, I wanted to explain why I say this each time. Firstly, it's to make sure that you're in the right place, particularly if you're someone new to the podcast and you're not sure what we're going to be talking about. It's pretty much energy efficient homes, sustainability, living more in sync with the planet, climate change comes up from time to time. Those are the sorts of issues you can expect. That bit is for you. The other bit is for me, the one where I say to create an energy efficient home before I turn 40 in August 2016. It's my target, my goal. I've been working towards it, but not really doing a lot. I've done a lot of research. so I know where I'm going. If I want to make this happen, and perhaps you're someone who works in the industry and thinking, Ben, you're cutting this really, really fine. Well, I'm trying to make it happen. And that's why this year, as we've gone into 2015, Normally, I set myself 10 goals or between seven and 10 goals of things that I'd like to achieve. They can be work. They can be family based, might be learning a language. This year, I thought, no, just concentrate on two things that you know are really, really important. One of those I've mentioned in the podcast before, this membership site that I'm hoping to launch in the next couple of months. You'll hear lots more about that, too. And the second one is buying a plot of land. This is imperative. And I want to get this done in the next couple of months. But the target that I've set myself is to buy a plot of land before I turn 39, which is in August, which would leave me a year to build the house and to find an architect. Well, you see, I know all the right people. It's going to be tricky to pick them. Anyway, let's move on from there. So I thought I'd let you know about that. Let's get to our podcast interview for today. We're going to do this in a roundabout way because I wanted to say to Matthew Cutler Welsh, congratulations. He's the host of the Homestyle Green podcast and he's clocked up his 100th episode. Well done, Matthew. Good work. And if you enjoy this podcast, no doubt you will enjoy his podcast too. The reason I mentioned Matthew here as we link into our guest for today is because when I told him that I was coming out to Australia who should I be going to interview? Is there anyone interesting, particularly in Sydney, because that's where my brother lives and I would be spending most of the time? And he said, Michael Mobbs. You need to go and look up Michael Mobbs. Michael Mobbs has written a couple of books, The Sustainable House, Sustainable Food, and he was a big inspiration to Matthew. So I thought this would be an opportunity for a bigger picture interview, more about sustainable living than specifically about building houses today. I hope you'll find it interesting, though. So I started by asking Michael when he became passionate about the environment. When I was about six on a farm out west, we were flooded and I didn't get to school for four months. The plane would come and drop off food in a sugar bag and go on to the next farm. And I learnt then of the might of the climate. That's been a gift, I think. So I didn't decide, I just had the environment, in a sense, forced on me as a child. It's interesting to me that we're talking right in the middle of Sydney City at the moment. So that's a very different contrast. Do you feel more secure here or can you see exactly the same problem that one day we might face that situation where we don't have those resources in front of us? That's a great question. How did a boy from the bush, the country of Australia, where I had a 360 degree horizon and I was an hour from town by car, how did I end up right in the heart of Sydney? I got here by degrees, but it's clear to me now that I couldn't go back. And I stay here because I have got my fingers in a lot of pies, whether it's the pie of a nearby bookshop where I can go and buy something that's just caught my eye or I can go and sit alone and be anonymous or 
I can go out with some friends tonight and eat food that has integrity to it. I know that if I were to go 10 kilometres west from here, uh, living in a, in a city, that I would be in a, an alien and unfriendly world where people like me, who are regarded as different, would be unwelcome. So I feel rich here. I feel in my own 360 degree horizon. It's just that it's crowded. As I speak to you, I have two chooks down the side of the house. I have um, a little beehive with native stingless bees and I have some little houses for microbats. They're about as big as a 50 cent coin and I have grapes and all that sort of thing. So it takes me a couple of days still to ride around my estate here on my horse in my mind but you can make your place your private world if you wish to no matter where you are whether you're Nelson Mandela in a jail cell whether you're just a boy from the bush trying to make sense of things as we are now as we speak in that sense then a house is perhaps different to how we've always talked about it before in this podcast, that it's very much the, the nuts and bolts of how you build it. What is it for you? When I bought the house in 1978, it was um, a brothel and seven women worked here. The agent said, Mirstrom mobs, why do you want to live in Chippendale? Any criminals and prostitutes live in Chippendale. And I thought that would be fine. It was a tough suburb. Now it's blander. There are people here mostly with money. And as I changed, so did the meaning of the house change for me. I confess, and if any of your listeners repeat this, I'll deny it. I practiced law for 19 years, so I'm on a long journey back to rejoin the human race. And I married, I had children... I had a divorce, and the house changed for those different passages of my life. And now it's a place for me to find solitude. Although that's a strange thing to say, I've had over 19,000 people through the house. I'm actually just content to be here and to have a place that's easy to walk from to get food, company. I don't need to own a car. So to me, I'm rich in that many of the things that I have, access to really high quality doctors, all those things, are here and I can get to them by foot or phone pretty well. Why do you open your house? There's a wonderful line in the Beatles song, Why Don't We Do It In The Road? I think it's a John Lennon piece. And he was writing about really living his private life in public. Sometimes it feels as though I've trained the guns on my own positions and I'm by turns sick of Michael Mobbs, who people know of, and sick of Michael Mobbs, who does interviews like this. And then I think, well, get over it. It's just something that you do. Just do it and and stop being grandiose about it. The reason I think I do it is the same as when it first occurred to me to open the house up, which is it's such an ordinary house. As you and I speak to each other and the light is on here, unless I told you, you wouldn't know it was coming from the sun. Unless I told you the glass of water I'd poured, you'd come off the roof. Unless I told you that the toilet water was recycled sewage, you wouldn't know it. It's an ordinary house, and the power of this house is that it's not a narcissistic look-at-me place. It's an ordinary house, and people come in and they say, wow, it's just an ordinary house. That's a really big thing, because lawyers, engineers, architects, planners, the media have mystified and complicated sustainable living, and people think it's outside their reach, and they have to be special to do it. The second reason is that the house has lots of mistakes and we can share those here 
and people can see that you can still do these things, make mistakes and do something that has value. So you don't need to be perfect, um, you don't need to be special and those are strong messages that the house sends I think. When I arrived here you mentioned to me that I don't know, perhaps I, I picked up on this, that you were constantly learning about houses. Would you like to build your own house one day? I'm not really someone to have around the house. I'd be the last person you'd want. I can barely change a light bulb, and if I do, I talk about it with pride for weeks. So this is a house for a complete dope, um, not a real man, and you know, a shiver of fear went through me when you suggest I might build my own house. What I do know now with certainty is that most of what I've done and called sustainable is in fact not. The house changed my life and I started doing things for which I had no qualifications. I wanted to win and did win a tender to build or fit out Google's new offices in Sydney and I was really keen to understand their thinking. And I discovered that the 53rd employee for Google was a chef who was passionate about local food and providing really good food for them. This is back in 98 or 9, just after the company had started. And I knew that the building was going to be a star building because it had all these things that were said to make it sustainable. And I discovered that they were trivial I discovered that an ordinary meal of a slice of toast, an egg, a small punnet of yogurt, a tomato and a couple of slices of bacon required, if it were produced and wasted in the typical way of Australian food, would need over 1,100 litres of water. So Google had 300 people in the office at that time, so that's 300,000 litres of water for breakfast, 300,000 litres of water for lunch, a million litres of water a day to feed the 300 Google people. The building's systems and this house's systems are trivial. My tummy requires 20 to 40 times more energy and water than does my house. So the long answer to your question is, I'm still discovering what sustainability is and I'm not spurred on to build my own house. I would like sometimes, and I'm thinking of moving out of this house, just to test this, I would like to be in a small house of about two rooms beside the coast in a very expensive area. I'd like to have this large block of land with a very small house on it. The house would be populated by a box of books, three or four types of Australian whiskey, and that would be it. And then I'd get around in sand shoes and shorts. Everything in the house would be recycled. The idea that I had of sustainability when I did this in 1996, 19 years ago, is very different to the idea I have it now. I'm building a house this year in seven days, entirely of recycled material. Not one tree will die for this house. And the idea of using plantation timber and calling that sustainable is just wrong. We've killed enough trees and we've got enough timber concrete, glass, steel, out of the earth. She can't take any more holes dug in her, trees cut down. So if I were to build a house on this block of land or anywhere, if I were to do that now, everything would be recycled, made in a factory in good working conditions, so that the number of trips, the wastage and everything would be basically as small as they could be. Throughout the interviews that I've done for this podcast and just thoughts that I've had over the last few years, 
it seems that nothing is sustainable and it's all about limiting your impact on the planet and I, I see where you're going but in my mind we've got to get to the point where each of us knows that damage that's going on and I'm not saying it's an easy calculation or way to find out that would at least allow you to compare and contrast and, and work a way down for example I've flown out here to Australia and that's the reason I did it was because I knew all my family would be out here this Christmas and I knew my wife loves Australia and wanted to come. But there's a huge impact in travelling all the way over here and I was chatting to someone on email and they said, oh, well, no, you can offset it by just switching off your heating for the next two years, which made me think, oh, great. <laughs> One of the world's finest journalists is um, from the UK, George Monbiot, who writes for The Guardian. He doesn't travel anymore for speaking engagements because once it's up there, you can't take it out. I mean, no one has saved a planet before. We really need to be humble as we deal with this and say, well, we're just doing our best. I agree with you. It would be good if six or seven billion people could be part of this conversation. But it's clear now we don't... I, th I think three things are clear. Firstly, greenies are the great political losers of the last 50 or 60 years. Secondly, that we don't have the time to persuade six or so billion people to change the way they live. And thirdly, that if we're to get this thing done and in the time that's required, the next five or ten years, in my view. The only way to do it is through the marketplace. And rather than fighting against the marketplace or seeking to persuade people as greenies do, I think we need to divide that strategy into two parts. Firstly, we need to be clear with ourselves that it's more difficult to get approvals for and to get tradespeople and materials and more expensive to go sustainable both in building things and in buying them day to day. And secondly, that we must find existing proven market mechanisms which will work to make it cheaper and easier to build and live sustainably. And I believe in some trials I'm conducting this year that I've got an, an option that's tried and proven. So I'm really keen to look back this time next year and see whether or not what I try to do this year has got merit. I'm taking people on my journey of building a house and we are all of a similar mindset that we want to live as best we can we're probably realists and we know it's not going to be perfect is there anything you would like to say or to pass on that could help that person um, two things firstly you don't have to be special to do this or rich or qualified that just has to come from your passion so hold on to that no matter what obstacles you will inevitably come across. The second thing is, don't see yourself as a failure if you don't do everything at once. For example, say you're listening to this and you say, well, he sounds like a reasonable enough bloke. But the idea of reusing my sewage to wash my clothes and flush my toilet and has my garden is unacceptable to me. And I want to keep putting it into the sea so I can swim with the fishies. Try to see that barrier, not through your eyes, but through the possible future sale of the property and future plumb your house. So do run that second pipe to the clothes washing machine and the toilet so that should the market change, you can sell it as future plumbed, ready to be connected up for a sewage or grey water recycling system. Don't see what you're doing as just for you. See it as a future, for a future buyer. 
And that will build some flexibility in your thinking. Does that answer your question? I think so. Moving on to a, a different aspect of all of this, providing food. You have touched on it throughout the interview. Mm-hmm. How has that changed your, your thoughts and, and what do you do in your daily life to try and keep yourself connected with food growing? So picture a suburb where I live where most of it is asphalt and concrete and buildings and if there's a bit of road verge um, it's pretty poor soil and probably most of the soil is dead. When I discovered that food is the second highest source of climate pollution after coal-fired power in Australia. I started growing food here and then I started growing food out in the street. And again, I did it badly. A lot of what I grow dies, but it changed our suburb bit by bit. And we grow some of our food here now and the streets are cooler as a result. So we, we and the Chippendale community can harvest bay leaves uh, rosemary, lemongrass, just some pretty hardy plants from the streets. And we do. In addition to that, but we, do, we probably get no more than half or one or two percent of those things we need from the streets or our gardens. The second thing I do is I go to farmers markets where I can talk to the farmers and know how and how they grow. And in doing so, I give them money they wouldn't get if they sold their products through chain stores. And thirdly, I can support food box services where farmers who can't get to the markets can provide their food in a retail system that bypasses the commercial or chain store markets. I think they're well named as chain stores. They chain farmers down in... people need to be clear if they're going to buy something from a chain store say it costs a dollar the farmer will get no more than five or six cents possibly ten cents in that dollar when I buy um, something from a farm at the farmer's markets he gets a whole dollar you mentioned community in that answer too and I get this gut feeling that communities are actually going to become more and more important than it's ever done before what are your thoughts on community it is we have a a strong community here people are proud of our streets the kids are proud of it we've got a little library across the road the kids painted and one of the girls goes out and checks it to see what books are in it for people to come and take quite often Uh, there's a a real resilience here and we come together unfortunately some of the things we want to do have been rejected by governments but of course they threaten or undermine the sources of income for governments when I look at the light that's shining now I know that in addition to the power that came from the sun seven minutes ago there's surplus power going into the grid and I'm being paid for that so I pay no electricity bills I pay no water or sewage bills because I'm not connected so I'm denying money to government owned businesses it's funny in a dry country that governments set up businesses to profit by selling money so the more water they sell the more money they make so a lot of the things that would sustain our culture threaten governments in different ways so for example the idea we have of getting rid of the garbage truck because we're going to recycle all our food and compost it here, threatens the men who like to drive big garbage trucks. That's why, even though communities can be articulate, strong and quite savvy in the way they deal with governments, at the end of the day, the only way, I think, to get the significant change needed in the way we consume food and materials has to be in a way that's going to work in mainstream chain stores or appliance stores and so on. And that's what I'm working on this year. We're getting towards the end of our time. I've really enjoyed this. But being here in Australia, is there anything that is unique or issues that Australians really need to get to grips with? 
I think we are about to go through a huge change in Australia. We are the lucky country. There are just 22 million of us. Very few of us have ever woken up wondering if we'll have food in our plate. We're well fed. We're a long way from centuries-old hatreds. But over a third of our food, which is grown for export, is about to implode. The Murray-Darling River system is in a death spiral. Most of it has got coal, gas, oil leases over it. Most of it is extremely vulnerable to climate change. And in 2008, when there were 32 countries who ran out of grain, you couldn't buy rice on the shelves of America Walmart stores. Of course, Thailand, um, one of the major rice producers, had failed. The rice crop had failed in China. Australia is ill-equipped to deal with shortages of food and we don't have the discipline that this country and America and England and other countries had during the depression of the 28, 1928 to 34 depression when although a lot of men and women were out of work in England they played in the streets and they had some happy lives. Now I'm not sure how our comparatively ill-disciplined society will cope with it being difficult to get work or have food when that occurs. It's not a question of if, but when. The second big problem, I think, facing Australia is we have a political class which is now at the end of its use-by date. The parties are so different from the days of their creation Uh, when there were ordinary men of vision and passion. Now they've really become the property of a political class and they give access to the wealthy. They really just don't connect anymore. We have, I think, leaders like those that we had during World War I when Millions of men were sent to their certain death by failed generals and politicians. And I don't think we've got a political class with a calibre to deal with the huge institutionalised problems we've got in this country which are about to burst upon us over the next four or five years. That's probably a good point to leave it, just unless you have one final thought. I don't want to end this conversation by focusing on the failure of our political class or our culture. I want to come back to why I did this house. I did this house because I didn't like the sound of my own voice. I was saying the government should do this, the government should do that. And now that I look back and see that I accepted that it's my own excreta, it's my own need to have energy at the power point, that I need. As soon as I accept a responsibility for meeting my own needs, that whinging, complaining tone left my voice and a part of me grew back that had been killed off by relying on governments to do things. And that's what gives me hope, is the fact that you're interested in talking about this, that so many people now are interested in doing things without government support. Michael, thank you very much. You're welcome. With each episode, we put together show notes, which include key information. We've got photos, links. And for this episode, that means photos of the sustainable house and Michael and links to his website. He also posts up when he's got a tour of his house and he's an interesting guy. So I'm sure you'll have a good chat with him. If you're passing through Sydney, look him up. We'll link across on today's show notes, which are at houseplanninghelp.com slash 83 couple of bits of business to close up with 
today. First of which is, I'm very pleased about this, that I'm going to be contributing to Passive House Plus this year. They got in touch with me. They're one of the industry magazines, so for the construction industry, and they just said, Ben, we're looking for more freelance writers, and we've targeted you. So I was very pleased that they were happy that if I just put together a handful of articles this year, that will be good for them. So I'll give you a nudge when one of those is posted, and hopefully that will be good. And secondly, this is an interesting one. I've managed to persuade Paul Jennings onto Twitter. So I wanted you to tweet at him just to make him feel welcome. At Door Fan Man. The other thing I'm slightly concerned about is that because I had to prod him, that he may just let his account hang. Do you ever have that? You sign up to something, perhaps a new social media, and you use it a lot, and then suddenly it all tails off. So I want to keep him on there because he's an interesting guy and has lots of great information. So that's Paul Jennings now on Twitter at door fan man. Next time, my guest is Claire Parry, director of the Australian Passive House Association. This will be the last one of the interviews that I recorded when I was out in Australia. Claire has projects that are quite spread out. It's Australia, for one thing. She also has projects in Asia. So that means that her passive house buildings have to function in very different climates. So I'm hoping to understand exactly what that means. I hope you can join me for that one. Cheers. <laughs>